coming up. The first American volunteer group of the Republic of China Air Force, more famously known as the Flying Tigers, was a group of American servicemen who were recruited under FDR's authority to leave their positions within the United States military to go and fight the invading Japanese forces in China long before the first bombs were dropped on Pearl Harbor. These American heroes brought some of the most amazing tales of heroism, sacrifice, and victory of the Second World War. This is their story. Before we get started, I'd like to say thank you to my Patreon supporters for making this video possible. If you want to get access to great bonus content and behind the scenes videos, please consider checking out my Patreon to support my hard work. Thanks so much. Enjoy. In the late 1930s, Japan had been aggressively taking land from multiple neighboring nations to expand their growing empire. They believed that this land was rightfully theirs. And like Hitler's conquests in Europe at the time, the first few of these invasions went largely unnoticed by the United States and other nations who mainly sought to maintain the peace. However, in 1941, FDR and the United States saw that neutrality was not going to be an option for much longer and began to try and support the Allied countries who were already at war. The United States had already started to send aid to Britain and China under the Lend-Lease Act which allowed America to ship materials, food, and oil to support the war effort. But FDR wanted to find another way to support their Chinese allies against Japan while also maintaining a neutral position on the war. The Chinese had an extremely outdated air force, and their planes were no match for the advanced Japanese fighters. In addition, their pilots were poorly trained and unorganized, so they had little to no hope of obtaining a reasonable air defense over China. This is where the concept of the American Volunteer Group was born. The AVG was to be volunteers from the American Armed Forces who would be discharged and sent to work for a private military contractor. By doing this, they were allowed to be shipped to China and fight the Japanese without the United States being perceived as actually sending military support. The volunteers that made up the AVG primarily came from the Navy, Marine, and Army Air Corps. These men would make up the majority of the combat pilots and servicemen. The remainder were mechanics and support personnel that came from various backgrounds, including 11 Chinese Americans. Seen here is one of the resignation letters used to leave the U.S. Marine Corps and accept a position with the Central Aircraft Manufacturing Company the private company that was set up to organize and recruit the AVG. The primary fighter used by the AVG was the American-made Curtis P-40. They originally received 100 P-40s to use in their outfit, but a good number of them were damaged in training accidents by inexperienced pilots. They quickly learned that the aircraft had to be well cared for as supplies and replacement parts were extremely hard for the AVG to obtain due to their unique situation as well as their remote location in China. Fortunately, these P-40s would be ideal for Chenault's outfit as they were great diving aircraft, very durable, and had strong pilot armor. So for this video, I actually came out to the Museum of Aviation in Warner Robins, Georgia to do some of my research for this video because they have an incredible replica of one of the P-40s that would have been used during this time by the American Volunteer Group. The AVG was quickly dubbed the Flying Tigers by its Washington support group, which would stick around as their famous title. The AVG aircraft were also painted with shark teeth on the front of their aircraft, which was taken from an RAF squadron in North Africa. However, that RAF squadron had supposedly taken it from German BF-110 fighters in Crete, as you can see here. The Flying Tigers, however, were the ones who would become synonymous with the shark teeth, as the green P-40s provided a perfect background for the nose art, and the intake helped create an iconic image on the front of the planes. The AVG was led by General Claire Lee Chenault, who had spent many years flying pursuit aircraft for the United States. Chenault was very passionate about fighter tactics and air superiority, so he taught his men accordingly. He ran a radically different approach to air combat compared to many other Air Corps commanders at the time. This was because Chenault had spent a great deal of time in China and had learned much about Japanese tactics and equipment. 
He taught his pilots to prioritize the use of altitude advantage since the P-40 was not nearly as maneuverable as the Japanese fighters that they would encounter. He had prohibited his pilots from entering in turn fights with the nimble Japanese fighters, telling them to execute diving or slashing attacks, then to pull away and set up another attack. This dive and zoom technique, as it was named, was contrary to what the pilots had learned in the U.S. service as well as what the Royal Air Force had taught their pilots in Burma. But Chenault had seen it successfully used by the Soviets against the Japanese. The actual strength of the AVG was never more than 62 combat-ready pilots and planes, so they faced many obstacles because their pilots were inexperienced and constantly outnumbered. The AVG also had no ranks, so there was no division between officers and enlisted men. The Flying Tigers greatly benefited from an early warning network system that Chenault had set up throughout their area of China. Civilian spotters from around the countryside would relay information as soon as the Japanese planes were seen overhead. It would then be radioed to the AVG, giving them enough time to take off and gain an altitude advantage over their opponents. This advantage was very similar to the one that the RAF had in the Battle of Britain using their radar systems at the same time. These early warnings were crucial for the P-40s and Chenault's diving air combat tactics. One of the most important early goals of the AVG was to protect what was called the Burma Road. Eastern China was under Japanese occupation, so all military supplies for China had to arrive via the Burma route from India. As they began to defend this sacred route, Tiger Eric Schilling, part of the 3rd Squadron, famously said, This was the beginning of the greatest adventure I would ever hope to experience. It wasn't until years later that I fully realized the magnitude and significance of this first step to be a lifelong adventure in the mystic Far East. Unfortunately, with many of the logistical, political, and language barriers that the AVG encountered, many of the initial plans were delayed. Because of this, although the first members began to arrive in China as early as April of 1941, the AVG's first official combat mission was not until the 20th of December. It was on this day when aircraft of the 1st and 2nd squadrons intercepted 10 unescorted Kawasaki Ki-48 Lily bombers attacking Kunming. These bombers would jettison their loads before reaching Kunming due to the engagement from the AVG fighters. This attack was likely a huge surprise to the Japanese pilots, because up until now the only resistance that they had encountered was weak Chinese aircraft that were vastly outdated and poorly trained. In this engagement, three of the Japanese bombers were shot down near Kunming, and a fourth was damaged so severely that it crashed before returning to its airfield at Hanoi. Later, Chinese intelligence intercepted Japanese communications, indicating that only one out of the ten bombers ultimately returned to base. Shortly after this, the Japanese discontinued their raids on Kunming while the AVG was based there. The only loss that the AVG had in this first sortie was a P-40 that was hit and forced to make a crash landing nearby. The pilot would be recovered and the plane was later salvaged for part. 
Coming less than two weeks after Pearl Harbor, this mission was one of the earliest American aerial victories in the Pacific War. Following this, the AVG would continue to plague Japanese fighter and bomber flights for the next six months over China. The most impressive aspect of the Flying Tiger's history is that despite being constantly outnumbered, the American pilots nearly always took down enemy aircraft at a disproportional rate. On December 25th, a large flight of 63 bombers escorted by 25 fighters was intercepted by less than 30 total AVG aircraft. In this encounter, an incredible total of 35 Japanese planes were taken down, likely on their way to bomb Chinese cities and airfields. The Allied flights only lost two pilots and five P-40s on the day. In January, the AVG continued to relentlessly attack Japanese bombers, taking down another 13 planes for just a loss of two of their own. By the end of January, the Flying Tigers had destroyed a total of 73 Japanese aircraft while losing only five themselves. However, the Americans continued to face challenges with logistics, aircraft parts, and loss of aircraft due to crashes and Japanese attacks on their airfields. Unfortunately, with the weak Chinese ground forces, the Japanese continued to push west into China. In addition, by the start of the spring of 1942, the AVG was down to less than eight operational P-40s. Because of this, the Flying Tigers were forced on more than one occasion to relocate their bases to the west as they evaded advancing Japanese forces. Fortunately, this also allowed them time to be reinforced by new P-40s to strengthen their numbers. As they settled in once again, their success and high kill rates would continue. However, Chinese and American commanders would soon push Chenault and the AVG into ground attacks on the Japanese. The intended purpose was to show the battered Chinese ground forces that they did indeed have air support so that morale could be boosted among their troops. These were dangerous missions, however, and the AVG pilots were not necessarily in agreement. They would much rather prefer the comfort of their dogfights than facing the hazards of Japanese anti-aircraft fire. But the ground attacks continued as planned regardless. Although these missions did do damage to Japanese targets, especially to a large number of Japanese planes on the ground, the AVG pilots did not come around to supporting these missions. In fact, they were so against them that there was a small pilot revolt in the spring concerning these missions. This was because the pilots felt that they were an unnecessary risk with no real value. Keep in mind that this sort of feedback from the pilots could only happen because this was not a standard military outfit with rank and order, but rather a private and individual group of volunteer flyers. Fortunately, Chenault would manage the stirring among his pilots and get things to normal shortly after. As the summer of 1942 came along, the AVG's success was undeniable, but with their great success came great attention. The United States Air Force wanted at this time to officially induct their group back into the United States forces. So the last official day of combat for the AVG appropriately would come on July 4, 1942, when they took down four KI-27s with no losses of their own. In total, the Flying Tigers, under the title of the AVG, would rack up an astounding 297 Japanese aircraft destroyed in just seven months. In comparison, they would lose just 14 pilots of their own, with another eight lost to bombing raids and accidents. In the summer of 1942, the AVG officially was inducted to the United States Air Force. Many of the pilots would leave the group and did not stay as it became the 23rd Fighter Group. Many of them had come to love the small and relaxed feel of their independent air force. However, the Flying Tigers would continue all the same. A few of the original pilots remained, including Tex Hill, 
one of the group's most loyal members as well as one of their highest scoring aces. One of the most notable servicemen drawn to the success of the AVG was Robert L. Scott. Here at the Museum of Aviation in his home state of Georgia, a replica of Scott's P-40E fighter is on display. It is complete with the Flying Tiger livery as well as his name and kill count on the side of the aircraft. Scott had made a name for himself as a pilot transporting supplies into China on the DC-3, a job commonly known as flying the hump, as it involved carrying these crucial supplies for the war effort over the dangerous mountain ranges from India into Kunming. He convinced Chenault to loan him a P-40 to fly to protect this valuable supply route. His aggressiveness and success in this role led him to be recruited as a commander of the new Flying Tigers as the 23rd Fighter Group. Scott would become known for leading the Flying Tigers and keeping the Burma Road protected from the air after the AVG joined the U.S. Air Force in 1942. He would often paint his propeller on his P-40 different colors on different missions to give the Japanese the impression of multiple planes in his force, when in reality it was only him flying. This effectively made him appear as a one-man air force to the opposing forces. He would end the war with a total of 13 Japanese kills to his name and would become one of the most notable pilots of the war when he would write the popular book, God is My Co-Pilot, a tale of his years flying over China. It would later be adopted into a popular film by Warner Brothers. This is the record of my experiences as a fighter pilot with General Chennault and the flyers under his command. The now it can be told saga of Chenault's tiger-hearted sons of thunder. You'll see Dennis Morgan reliving the adventures of one of our greatest aces, Colonel Robert Lee Scott. At the end of the war, the Flying Tigers would be dubbed one of the most successful fighter groups of World War II. Despite being constantly outnumbered and undersupplied, the American volunteers would consistently deliver staggering blows to the Japanese forces over China. In addition, their sacrifices and contributions are even more noteworthy as their service was purely on a volunteer basis and they had to resign from the United States military roles to participate. They also entered their positions months before the U.S. officially entered the war, making them heroes for supporting the war effort long before the first bombs were dropped at Pearl Harbor. This group of young men is one of the most courageous and valiant forces that the world has ever seen, and should be remembered forever for their bravery and success in the face of daunting odds with little reward. I hope you enjoyed this documentary. If you want to support my content, please check out the links here or in the description for my Patreon and my merch store. Please make sure to click subscribe and comment down below if you have any ideas for future videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.